All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. Today is a good day. We have Jonathan Crutchfield with us. Jonathan is single family and multifamily man with over 500 units owned, um, over $30 million in uh, assets under management. He is with uh, Grab the Map, tons of experience to go into. Um, so I'm super excited to jump into this. Jonathan, thank you very much for having on the show. Hey, Gabe, man. Excited to be here and thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, I mentioned before we got on here, we always like to start with stories and hear how you guys, how these investors that come on the show got started in real estate, because everybody always has a very colorful story to, to start them off. So why don't you take us to the beginning of your story and tell us how'd you get started? Yeah, so regular guy, grew up in you know, Tallahassee, Florida, uh, was living the dream, right? Where you follow what your parents ask you to do. Um, go to school, listen to your teachers, get good grades, and then maybe you can go to college, right? So the whole journey of of uh, listening to my parents and staying on the straight and narrow <laughs> and uh, ended up, you know, following that rule to the T, became a teacher of all things. So I could tell other kids to do that same thing, right? <laughs> and then uh, ended up being a principal and a professor at a college. So okay you know, went through and matriculated all the schooling, which is supposed to produce more salaries, supposed to produce a better life, and then really got to the end of it and realized that I was an entrepreneur <laughs> and that this whole time I was seeking the, the environment where I could create value, right, mm -hmm. that, where I could create things. Um, and so having had a fun, fun experience uh, serving school communities in Memphis and Louisiana, uh, before meeting someone who was a real estate investor who kind of got me interested in the idea of rental properties. Okay. And so, you know, first uh, experiences with, with real estate was like Dave Ramsey telling me, don't do it, don't borrow any money. And <laughs> Dave <don't>... <laughs> Ramsey, man, our parents' generation just love that guy, but he gives the they love financial him. advice. <laughs> they love him. And what's funny is I've I've been, you know, Checking into a few of a little bit of his new content, and they're they're edging stuff in there. They're edging stuff in there now. That's good. Um, those the young the young people is his daughter, and people are starting to edge in a little bit of more uh, investment advice. But no, I had a had a ton of fun listening to him. He helped us to get a budget. He helped me to actually start thinking about the money that was coming in and going out, which I think is very important. Um, and then started listening to podcasts, old stuff like Clayton Morris on the Rental Income Podcast and um, just a few other guys that started getting me thinking about, okay, I can have passive income um, as a way to increase my salary, not just put in more time, right? Yeah. And I think that idea of passive income got me into this. Uh, ask me how I feel about passive income these days. And I say, hey, make sure you find a good operator and put your money in as much as you can get in because that's that's the that's about the closest you're going to get to it now <laughs> yeah yeah passive income um truly passive income really doesn't exist in real estate unless you're investing into somebody else's syndication 100 um, <laughs> percent. and even then i mean you should really be doing a lot of due diligence to vet the vet the operator there's a lot of front front loaded work that you do need to be doing it's not like you know stock market where you just you just put some money in and it starts to print money. You got you to gotta do a lot of um, upfront uh, work to make sure that it works for you. 100%. Nice, man. So um, you, you kind of glossed it over at the very beginning. You said you met someone who was in real estate. Was this like a family member? Um, how, how did you really get introduced to real estate in the beginning? Yeah, so um, elder at my church, you know, okay. was on, on his computer after, uh, after church one day. And it was like one of those meet and greets where you're supposed to be fellowshipping, you know, mm -hmm. but he was on his computer and I saw this stuff and I go up to him and I'm like, hey, man, you're supposed to be talking to people, not over here working. And he was like, actually, you need to come look at this. I'm buying and properties, man. Yeah. He had this Excel spreadsheet on it and he was like, this is my retirement plan. Oh, and man. there were like 40 or 50 properties on the list. And I was like, what do him. you mean? And so he ended up explaining it to me and I was like, okay, I could have this too. And he, he laughs about it now because he thought he was explaining to me 
uh, he thought he was explaining to me how I could have this investment portfolio on the side of my job. He uh, never thought that I was going to like, end oh, up wait. buying. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was That's like, funny. don't don't show me. Once you show me, I know how to implement. Nice man. Um, so once you you know you got the bug, you started listening to the podcasts. You met this elder at your church. Um, what was the first deal that you took down? Yeah, so first deal I took down for real, seriously, was a uh, you know fifteen thousand dollar house. Man, I le cheap. leveraged a credit. Yeah, Mississippi <laughs> oh, leveraged a, It's it's everything you would imagine a fifteen thousand dollar house would be. Yeah. Um, and actually, I can go full circle with this story now because I sold that house about six months ago. Oh wow! And uh, fifteen thousand dollar house, everything you would imagine. You know, bad area, bad you know, windows, bad smells, bad, you know, bad, bad, all bad, around. bad, 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 bad. Yeah. <laughs> but Hey, I could afford it. <laughs> yeah. It was something that I could get my hands into. Um, and we used a lot of sweat equity on that house. Uh, my wife and my kids, I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old at the time and my four-year-old, and my two-year-old helped me paint some stuff inside and there you go. we got less stories from the house. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> putting them to work early. Yeah, but that first deal, you know, was where I realized that I could actually add value to a house. Um, doing that sweat equity made the house worth more, and it also created a safe, you know, place for people to live. Yeah. So, you know, it's pretty cool that um, that has now turned into us doing that for a business, and that's what we do every day. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, those really cheap houses, I always... I always actually tell people not to go that route just because there is a chance that it's going to be, you're going to be dissuaded from continuing the journey just because of all the work that really is involved, especially, you know, I've got, I've had houses passed over to me that were like $5,000 in Mississippi. Um, but they are, they're just gut, gut rehabs, um, which I mm -hmm. feel like is a really difficult endeavor to get into when you're just starting. Um, but if it works out for you, I feel like that is a, that's a really good starter, um, to, because, you know, you're getting into it really low, uh, you're putting in the sweat equity and then you're taking out the equity. Once you sell it, um, you said you just went full circle on that house. What did you sell it for at the end? Yeah, I sold the house for 85 grand. There you go. I, I had owned it for over seven years. Okay. So, you know, it definitely went up in value. I also got the depreciation from it, you know, all of the appreciation, all of the interest, you know, I borrowed money against it. So it definitely served its purpose. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm actually making this decision with, you know, 20 to 30 properties in our portfolio right now. And what's interesting about what you said is that I wouldn't buy them again. Yeah. Right. Like we 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 did what we could do based on our mindset at the time, which was, hey, I've got this fifteen thousand dollar credit card. Like, let's figure out how to leverage it into, you know, something. It wasn't it wasn't very deep thinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, and I, I think mean, a lot you, of people start like that. You know, what's awesome about your story, though, is that you took the first step that you knew. And I feel like that's what people really need to do when they're, you know, they're kind of. um their world has been opened into real estate. They understand the potentials of it to get started. You just need to take that first step. If it's buying a $15,000 house and that is the step that you, you can see in front of you take the step um, because more steps are going to be opening up to you as you continue down your journey. As I mean, you're at what, what do you say? 500 units now over $30 million assets under management. So that first step was necessary for you at that time. Um, and then once you got that deal done, there were, you went through the process, you kind of understood how it worked and I'm sure more paths started opening to you. You kind of understood how the game worked a little bit better because you had that experience. A hundred percent. And that still happens, you know, at the level that we're at today is the more experience you get, the more you can kind of adjust and figure out, okay, what do I like doing? What don't I like doing? What was easy? What was, you know, less easy. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm, I'm using my words carefully there because none of it's easy. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> um, sweet. So let's uh, let's fast forward just a little bit. Uh, you bought that first house. It went out. It went well. You put your sweat equity into it. Um, now you have 500 units. So tell us a little bit about the evolution of your uh, your career. Um, give me specifically go over like the the flex points, the 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 
catalysts that you kind of ran into, um, the moments that really catapulted you where you kind of had that aha, aha moment and realized like, this is going to be the next step for me. Sure, sure. So the headline 500 units is kind of um, interesting because there, there is a, I have actually have no idea how many units we actually own today. <laughs> it's a, it's um, a rough number. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a rough number and people like, put that number out there because it's it, it is a, it's it's quite an achievement at, at one point it was 500 I don't know it might be more than that now but the whole point is at some point you realize that if you have systems and you have the right people in place you can replicate a process over and over and over again yep. um, and not only that I think the eureka moment for me was once I realized that there were owners who owned multiples that mm -hmm. wanted to get out so instead of doing it one deal at a time or one property at a time, we started seeking out portfolio owners, right? People that had more than one. It's actually still my favorite list that we use to, to look for off-market properties today. And we started making offers against multiple properties instead of just making offers on one at a time. And that that can be a real game changer for folks that are trying to scale up. Yeah. Yeah. And the benefit that I don't feel like is talked about often um, when you're dealing with portfolios is that sometimes you get a discount on the on the, an individual house because you're buying multiple houses. Um, uh, you know, 100%. in the seller's mind, they're like, I have 30 houses that I need to dispose. I don't want to go through the sales process 30 times. Um, so yeah. I will give you I'll give you a, a discount on my properties because you're buying them all at once and it reduces the headache me, Mr. Seller has to go through in order to get these sold. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And as someone who now has been on both sides of it, you know, we've bought and we're sold. We're not just buyers. Like we are also selling all the time. So it certainly is convenient once you realize that you're dealing with real buyers to try to figure out what their goals are and mm. try to figure out if you can work a deal that helps them accomplish their goal and helps you accomplish yours. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so what are some, let's talk about the sales process real quick. You're dealing with portfolio owners. That means that they are, they're relatively sophisticated. It's kind of like a commercial owner um, where they understand what they're talking about. How does that sales process work? How do you negotiate the deal once you get in contact with the seller? Yeah, so it's really about a conversation, right? Like it's about alignment. So, you know, a lot of times they're ready to sell. You're trying to figure out what their reason for selling is. Um, some of the most common reasons for selling are they're trying to trade into another asset. They're trying to grow into a, another asset that they just got they're tired, right? They have a headache. Um, maybe it's time to pay a tax bill and they they have to move assets around. But once you figure out what their reason for selling is, then you try to figure out if your, you know, your goal is in alignment with theirs, which most of the time as investors, we're trying to get equity. We're trying to buy uh, at a discount. We're trying to get, you know, we're trying to get that value add opportunity. Um, and so if there is alignment between those two things, um, then at that point, we certainly look for a way to make an offer where both people win. And that's those are the deals that have worked the best for me, uh, not the ones where I stole the property. You know, we all have those stories, but the ones where the seller worked it out at terms that made a lot of sense for me and the um, the deal made a lot of sense for them as well because they're getting what they want out of the deal. Um, so are you buying in a single metro or is this spread out across different metros? Yeah, so it just really depends on the deal. So mm -hmm. I like to look at deals. I don't really turn down any market unless unless it's unfortunately snow there. Um, I like southern markets. I don't like snow at all. I've done a few deals where there was like consistent snow. The, and I just don't, water, I don't huh? like, I, yeah, I don't like sending my team there. I don't like going there. So um, usually I stay in the Southeast, you know, Texas, enough, Mississippi. So you're, not, you're not coming up here to Seattle, then. Well, hey, I look, guess it would, it, it would be the fastest. No, unless, <laughs> un and I'm not saying I'm not coming. I'm just, I don't want to buy and hold something. Yeah. Um, unless I was a great operator like you, right. That I could, you know, invest with. Or there, something you go, like that. there you go. Unfortunately, yeah. I actually don't invest in Seattle. So <laughs> you're going to have to find somebody else. 
there you go. There you go. Nice, man. Um, so portfolio owners, you're, you're, you've grown to this point. What is the next step for you? What are the next like two to three years look for, like for you? Yeah, so this is going to be an interesting time in the market. I think that's a great question. Um, we're still looking for great deals. And mm -hmm. so we flip single family properties. We look for properties in the DFW area, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, we look for properties in great locations where we can create value and turn those over. Um, that keeps our crews busy. That keeps the equity added to the bottom line of the company. Um, and we also look for holes, but we look for really distressed situations. We're looking for owners or banks that are in trouble and they have a reason to get out of the property. And for that reason, that means that we're not finding these every day everywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what it looks like probably for the next two, three years is, is building equity, building capital, building relationships and looking for those deals. Really, we call them steals um, if we're going to hold them. Steal the deal. Yep. Those are the ones that you want to keep in your portfolio um, because those are the ones that, that create the most cash flow, which is king in real estate, in my opinion. Um, all right, man. Well, that rounds us through the first section. It is now time to jump into the quick question round. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, it starts with books or any form of education. Could be movies, could be Netflix shows, whatever. I just need two recommendations, one for general life wisdom and then one for real estate. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, let's start with a real estate related book. Um, and I hate to mention books that everybody's read. Um, but, you know, I think Rich Dad, Poor Dad is something that we need to be reminded about. We need yeah. to read it. You know, people are like, well, if you if you can't think of a book, mention Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But I've, um, uh, I've asked my listeners to keep a tally of the number of investors who say that book to come <laughs> on here. Um, and <laughs> I've gotten only a few responses way back when, cause I haven't asked in a while, but if anybody out there is listening, please tell me how many episodes you've listened to where they have said rich dad, poor dad, because I think it's gotta be 90% or more, um, for good reason. It is the best book to read when you're just getting started. It, uh, it gives you the motivation. Yes. Especially if you had a poor dad, mm, there you go. Right? That's the reason why it comes to mind so easily because so many of us resonate with the dad who taught us to trade time for money. Mm. And I think that that is a good place to start if it's a real estate related book, asset related book. Um, personal right now, um, I think Atomic Habits okay. is a great book for folks that are trying to change their behavior or change the outcomes in certain areas of their life. You know, whether it be diet or exercise or you know, just mindset, mood. We look at the ways that um, we can make things easier for ourselves that we really want to do and make things harder for ourselves that we don't want to do. I think that's a big takeaway from Atomic Habits. It's worth every bit of time that somebody would read it. Nice. Yeah. I uh, I read that book a while ago. I can't, I feel like they had some good um, examples of, I remember them talking about how you need to make things easier, things harder, like if you yep. want to drink a glass of water in the morning, put it on your nightstand. Uh, yep. So when you get combine up, it with another right one, yep. <laughs> yep. Just Com like that, combine. So. It's it's like me. Like okay, so like Wednesday, Wednesdays I teach Bible class in my church, right? So it's like I've been teaching the class and walking at the same time, right? Because it's Zoom anyway, and the kids kind of know that hey, he's he's semi-distracted. <laughs> um, but it combines a habit that I know that I'm going to do. It's there with something that I might skip if I didn't do it. That's certainly one of the things that it teaches. But one of the other takeaways for me has just been like making it harder. Yeah. Like making it harder. Yeah. So if like you don't want to eat sugar, put it like way up at the top yeah. of, the, of the freezer or something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Or like mine lately is like, if you want to wake up at a certain time, like put that alarm away from where you have to get up <laughs> yep. and that does it every time. So yeah, man, I appreciate you asking that for sure. Sweet. Yeah. Good. Uh, good recommendation. Atomic habits. Um, all right. That leads us to the next question. This is for your younger self. Um, let's go back to the Jonathan who is, uh, still a teacher, still a principal, um, way back when go to him, look him in the eye, give him one piece of advice moving forward. Every relationship that you have <laughs> should be with people that are headed in the direction that you want to go. 
So if you are spending time cultivating relationships, you should really look at what the goals of those people are that you're surrounding yourself with and make sure that you're aligned. Um, I spent a lot of time caring about what people thought that I couldn't tell you where they're at today. Um, and probably shunning off some people that I should have gotten closer to um, at that time. I think that we should spend a lot of time cultivating our relationships and looking for alignment. Yep, absolutely. Values first. That's a, a great way to live life, especially when it comes to the relationships. Yep. Um, all right. Next question is about your business. Uh, the first three positions we hire form the foundation of our business moving forward. So what were the positions for you? Um, and if you did it again, would you do them in a different order? Yeah, I would do them in a different order. Um, first position I hired for was a property manager. Mm. And that person started, you know, dealing with the tenants and all my paperwork, um, really kind of an assistant slash, you know, property manager. Second position I hired was for an assistant. <clears throat> that person paid the bills and handled the mail when it came in you know, check my calendar and all of that. And then the third position I hired for was a virtual assistant, a VA, which, you know, can kind of do all around things, make flyers, photos, marketing materials, all these things that, you know, I don't want to get bogged down in time with. Um, if I could go back and switch the order, I would hire a VA first because I think it's one of the most important positions for entrepreneurs or business owners. And you can start with a very small amount of hours. But it saves you so much time if you could just think about what are the tasks that I don't need to be doing and offload those to a very cheap outsourced labor source. Yep, absolutely. Um, and one kind of thing that I want to throw in there, VA, I 100%, that's the first thing you should hire. Um, I have noticed, I've I've hired so many VAs in my career. And yep. uh, I've, you know, I, I rarely, if it's a virtual assistant, they're generally outside of the US. Um and I've been having a lot of luck with uh, Egypt and South South Africa VAs um, recently. And so if you guys are out there and you're looking for VAs, most of them are going to come from India, Pakistan, Philippines. They're great. They're still great VAs. Um, but I'm just saying recently I've had a lot of luck with, uh, with Egypt and um, South Africa, mostly because their accent is not, um, it's similar to what we kind of experience here in the U S and so it just goes a little bit easier when they're on the phone. Um, so that just something I had to throw out there, uh, something I kind of noticed recently. So, all right. Next question is about the U S it's a big place. A lot of opportunity out there. Give me the single Metro you're most excited about investing in today. I love Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, okay. it makes it easier cause I'm spending a lot of time there. It's home now. Um, it also makes it easier that we've seen 7,000 people moving here every day. Um, oh, every day. That's it, crazy. It, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. Um, but also what we see is business friendly government. We see, um, lots of labor and available labor for investors, people that are trying to get in the business. Um, it's just a great place to live. So DFW, check it out. There you go. All right. Next question is about finding deals. It all starts with getting in contact with the seller and writing up that purchase agreement. So what is your favorite way to generate leads and find new deals? Ooh, that's tough. My favorite way today has changed. My favorite way today to do it is to have websites set up that you drive traffic to and you're getting leads that are coming to you uh, per click. That's my favorite way today. <laughs> Back when you didn't have a lot of money, I'm sure that was not your favorite way. That was definitely not even an option. <laughs> <laughs> PPC is great. Um, I absolutely it, it does cost uh cost money and it in my experience, it takes a lot of testing. Um, so if you don't have the budget to hire a third party company to do it for you, um, and, or you don't have the time to do it yourself. Uh, things like cold calling mailers, um, probably a better route, but PPC for sure is, uh, it's a great, great way to generate leads. All right. Next question is, I lost my spot. I do this so many times. Oh, there we go. Lessons learned. You've done tons of deals, 500 plus units. I don't, you know, there's gotta be tri double, triple that in the number of deals that you've done in your career. So I'm sure some of those did not go the way that you planned. Um, so give me one deal that went a little bit sideways and then uh, tell me about the lesson that you pulled from that deal. Yeah, so I would combine them all and I would just say 
you know, make sure you're well capitalized yes. for projects. Um, I've had lots of projects that I got started. It was a great idea. We run out of capital, right? Mm -hmm. You have to figure out how you're going to raise the capital or you have to lose the deal or it takes forever and you're losing money on the interest, all kinds of stuff. So really make sure that you have a plan when you buy that property for how you're going to fund, not just the purchase, not just the rehab, the holding costs, all of the expenses related to that transaction. And if you don't have a very solid plan, don't buy it. <laughs> this is really, really important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've learned that lesson myself. Um, and it's just so tempting, especially when you find a really good deal and you really want to buy it. Uh, but you, you, you know, you don't have the, a plan or the funds currently to, uh, to do the full, to execute the full plan to get from purchase to rehab and all that stuff. Uh, if you don't have that, you're right. Just don't do it. Um, because things can go wrong and you're going to get stuck with something that you can't finish. Um, 100%. Great, great <laughs> lesson. All right. That leads us to the very last question. This is for the listeners. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. I'm sure people want to reach out, get in contact with you. Where can they find you? And then what can they expect when they reach out? Hey, I am pretty much everywhere. You can look at grab the map on Instagram. Uh, my name is Jonathan Crutchfield Jr. on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, if you go to my website, grabthemap.com, you'll figure out kind of where we are and what we're doing. Um, I'm always, always, always posting motivational tips or walkthroughs of properties. So there's tons of content information available there. Um, always also active in the Dallas DFW market um, investing space. So meetups, all kinds of things, opportunities available for folks that are interested in working with us. Perfect. I will put that link in the show notes, um, grabthemap.com. If you guys want to reach out, just click the little more in the description. It'll pull down that full description and in there you can find John's links. Gabe, right, thank you man, for doing this, man. I know, I know it takes time and energy and resources on your part. So appreciate you for doing this and pushing this out and being consistent with your podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. And we appreciate uh, having you on here and sharing everything that you've shared with us. Um, so yeah, thanks for hopping on. For yes. everybody who's here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason we do this. So if you have any questions, reach out to me, Gabe, at the real estate investing club.com. Um, if you want to support the show, give us a like, subscribe, share. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great week. Keep rocking real estate. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.